sure have come alive with the running of the wagon race. Chuck Wagon Evolution. Although Kelly Sutherland represents the modern era of check wagon racing, he understands the old. I mean, in those days, those, those old guys, they, they set the barrels tough because they had really good turning outfits. And you made one mistake and you ended up on your lid. I spent till I was about the age of 21, 22 being quite, actually really scared. Uh, Partially because I was breaking an outfit, but partially because I didn't really know where I was going and I had enough horsepower that I knew I was going to end up somewhere. It'd be nothing to see two to three wagons upset every chuck wagon meet we went to. It's still half the pressure it used to be because the barrels are set so much softer. Like they're way softer. If you can't drive around these now, you you got some kind of trouble, you see. Once a fine outrider, Norm Haynes is now the Calgary Stampede's head chuck wagon judge. When we was in the old half mile track, the barrels were set up so it was a lot sharper turns coming to the track. And now as you'll know, we got number one set off a little bit and two and then three's almost coming straight onto the track and the other one's on the track. So this has eliminated a lot of that wagon sliding and that coming to the racetrack. It's taken a lot of, a lot of the danger out of it. The old steel barrels and stoves had been dangerous, but the first night of racing on the new Calgary infield, Ron David discovered the value of a metal pole. That was my first crack at that new Calgary track. It was, uh, yeah, it was uh, July 4th, 1974, so I remember it well. <laughs> my first race in Calgary, uh, Ronnie David's pole broke. To give you a little idea of what a boy I mean by a pole breaking, it'll start the snake back and forth because it's out of control. It breaks off up by the neck yoke. And then when it digs in, the horses are still hooked to your double trees at the back, therefore bringing the wagon forward, driving it out uh, through the bottom of the floor of the, of the wagon box. And that's where the driver's at. When the pole dug into the ground, the wagon stopped so fast that the stove rack actually broke off one corner and swung around to the back wheel. And it drove him at least 30 feet in the air. And yeah, I was right beside him. And I was sure missing the farm that day when that happened. I thought, what am I doing out here? Look what's happening. I hung onto the lines. I went as high as they let me go. And then I kept going. And of course, the horses kept broke free of the wagon. They kept going. And uh, I was spinning a lot. I can remember the track going away from me and I remember the track coming back to me and then when I hit I I was out of course then. And, uh... Ron David suffered a broken back and pelvis, a ruptured spleen, a half dozen broken ribs and a punctured lung. But he was walking with crutches within a month and back competing the following year. The new softer barrel turn, collapsible barrels, metal poles, flak jackets for outriders, and keen-eyed judges all contribute to safer racing. But one of the greatest dangers to men, and especially to horses, was overlooked until it contributed to the worst accident in the history of chuck wagon racing. The wreck began when a lead horse stumbled after stepping into the stove rack. Three outriders were injured in the crash, but it was the fate of three horses that caused the greatest uproar, and rightly so. Something had to be done. The Calgary Stampede contacted head judge Norm Haynes and gave him full reign to design an enclosed stove rack. You go ahead and get a wagon. We'll bring it in here and we'll put our, um, you know, we'll, we've got carpenters here. We'll tear it down and put it back together. And we'll, I think it was five times we tore that thing down and put that back up and finally decided that that's the way it should be. So uh, everyone is happy about that. Along with a new stove rack, came a light rubber stove that could be loaded with one hand and collapsed if run over by a horse or a wagon. Other than the size and the weight of the stove, the Outrider's tasks have changed little since the races began. It's still a four second penalty to leave the stove, one for each peg or the canvas fly left dragging. Veteran Outrider Jim Nevada explains the tasks, then shows us what it's like to follow a racing chuck wagon. The stove man goes in first and pulls the stove out and then he backs off so the peg men can come up and get their, their tarp straight out. Your pegs have to be on the ground or it's a second penalty so 
the idea is to, for both of your peg men to throw at the same time so you don't get that back and forth action. It's an even throw and straight in. Outriders, horses, drivers, wagons. Come rain, come shine, dust or mud. Like the postman, the chuck wagons always deliver. In 65, it started raining and it never quit. And the track went from a heavy mud track to a soup track with a hard bottom. And the wagons picked up speed again. When I went to jump my horse at the uh, top barrel, Orville Stanquist had already mounted his horse. He was riding with us. When Orville mounted his horse, his horse crowded over again me as I went to make my jump and it pinned me between my horse and his. That's the way he took me out onto the track. I'd already rode the horse that I was riding in one heat, so he was muddy and I was certainly muddy. When uh, we hit the track, normally if you just drop your feet and hit the ground, the speed of a horse running will kick you into the saddle. But that year, with the track being so deep with the mud, when I dropped to kick into the saddle, instead of me kicking off the ground, the ground sucked me in. And as I went down, I'd, my hands were jerked off the saddle horn and I grabbed for the stirrup and missed it. And then sat down on the lead line. The horse I was riding was a horse called Tony. And he was a hard-mouthed old devil like to be with the wagon. So being that way, me being on the end of that lead line just didn't mean a thing to Tony. He carried me right along for about 100 yards. I finally lost the last knot on the lead line and slid to a stop. I picked myself up. My legs were sore where old Tony had stepped on me a little bit. But I walked over to the uh, inside fence at the grandstand and was going to lean against it and there was a uh, Commissioner standing there and he decided that maybe I should be on the inside of the fence instead of on the track side. So that's where I was, standing watching the wagons come home when the uh, Sun reporter, Randy Hill, took a picture of me. Oh, for the life of an outrider, but they do love it, and so do their horses. I think the horses like it just as well as you do. You can drive a team out in the field or anywhere and set up a set of barrels and they're just on the edge. They're just as much show off as us cowboys are. They like it. Ward Willard's great swing leaders certainly love to show off. Here's a, a big raised faced horse that was bought for $350. Bought him up for uh, Ronnie Glass. And uh, he was a barrel hunter. Uh, he could turn a barrel so hard, his shoulder would be a, about that far off the ground. But yet he turned so short, the wheel team wouldn't be able to get around there. So I had this black wheel team on there, just about had the same brains God gave a sparrow. And they'd just charge, and they'd just whip that wagon around there. And I broke every track record at every major show that there was that I went into. Ward took Swing Leader and his mates all the way down to Cheyenne's famous frontier days. One evening near the end of the show, 
Ward's crew washed the wagon, too late for even the hot Wyoming sun to dry it. I pulled out to the track and lined up. As I was pulling out there, the announcer uh, saying to all these people down there, because of the fact I had been fortunate and had won down there the previous two years and and I uh, broke the track record a few times. He'd, he was really giving me much too much credit, but he was screaming about how, hey, here's the driver, here's the man, here's all this. <laughs> I'm busy looking down on the floor watching this water sloshing back and forth as I'm pulling up to the barrels, thinking, oh my God. When that guy let that, down there, they use a gun instead of a Claxton. He let that cannon go off, them horses fired as hard as they could, and that water being down there so slick, I went through my bounce off, slid me right underneath the seat, and I went down into the box. And uh, I let the line slide, because I didn't want to pull them off into my competitors, hoping they'd go straight on, but I was at the mercy of whatever them horses did. I uh, slipping and sliding around that water, and got it back up in the box, and I was a, uh, by now I was on the first turn. I was ahead of everybody, but I wasn't sure what had happened because I was back at the stove rack most of the time and had taken off so hard. Anyway, we went around the track. I watched my competitors as they went by. They're all smiling. We all nodded to each other and still don't know what's happening. As I'm going past the grandstand, that announcer says, as I told you, ladies and gentlemen, this is the man that can drive. He's the one that's done her every year. <laughs> I never even saw the race. The horses did it all. The modern chuck wagon horse is a top flight racing thoroughbred. The reason that you like to see him run at the racetrack is you know if they have ability to run but that has no bearing on whether they would work on the chuck wagon or not. Oh, I pay from $1,000 to $3,500. It just depends on the type of horse, and sometimes it's a $1,000 horse that's a good one. It doesn't have to be an expensive horse to be a good horse. You could hook cigar on a wagon, he might not be worth a hoot, and, and you know, you could go buy a $1,000 horse that can't run at the racetrack, and he might be your star. Six-time world champion driver Kelly Sutherland had his first horse given to him by Dave Lewis in lieu of outriding wages. The skinny little three-year-old named Chicago Mike just wouldn't settle down for trainer Bobby Marsh. Bobby had bought this goat and threw, uh, put in the stall trying to settle the horse down and he'd come out the next morning and, and the horse was so hyper he'd walk the goat and, and actually trampled the goat to death all night. He would have a path buried in a 10 by 10 stall. It was just incredible. And uh, I wasn't too impressed, but I didn't have uh, anything else. So uh, I said, well, he's probably good enough for me. And once we got a lot of feed in him and got him broke, he, he turned out to be an incredible animal. Uh, he was a big charging uh, uh, strapping horse by the time he was five, six years old. And uh, he was the one that would take me out of there on the left-hand side. And he'd actually pack a weaker right-hand leader. He charged so hard. I'd say 90% of the horses, they, they seem to like a position, and that, that means you just sort them around, kind of have a look at them, at where they seem to relax the best, where they, where they tend to want to turn. You know, you need some charge on the left-hand side. You need a, a horse on the right-hand side that doesn't cheat when you're turning at the barrel. By not cheating, Kelly means a right-hand horse waits for the driver's signal, a tug on the line to turn. Well, he was a right leader. He was one of them horses that you know, like a right leader is a real important horse as far as I'm concerned because he's the one that has to make the turn and uh, the rest just have to follow him kind of, you know. But uh, he never was in trouble. The horse never did get into trouble. We were always on the front end with him, you know. And so, I mean, when you're on the front end, it's, it's tough for a horse to get into trouble. He's one of them special horses, I guess. Everybody seems to have one in their life. And uh, Gopher, I bought him as a five-year-old out of Saskatoon. Uh, they give 63000 for him as a yearling. And uh, he had only three wins when I bought him. And uh, well, I used him up till he was 18 years old. So I got a lot of years out of him. And you know, he's still, right now, he's still running the, the fields at home. George Norman never believed in pushing a young horse too hard. A three-year-old's nice. You know, you get a young, young horse, he's sound, generally sound. You get an early start, uh, but you can't run him very hard. You might go two or three trips as a three-year-old. Then when they turn four, they get a little better, and then uh, they, they know the 
they know what they have to do time they're five years old and then you've got them for four or five years and they'll work at their best from five on. George pushed himself and his young outriders a little harder. Practice makes, well, winter practice makes for awfully cold feet. When it comes to hands though, and handling a horse, Kelly Sutherland learned to use a soft touch. Uh, strength's important to, for control, but you have to have the ability to have really soft fingers or soft hands, and, and those horses tend to relax, because the only communication you have with them is, is down the lines, and, and that's just like telegraph phone lines to them. Legendary linesman Ralph Vegan was Kelly's mentor, and both Vegan and Alan Bensmiller influenced the driving style of Herman Flad. Flad explains how he handles his lines on the critical top barrel turn. I just drive like this, and then when I get to the top, I reach over and grab this and suck him back like this, eh? Alan Bensmiller also taught his son, Buddy. Well, the way he taught me was to bring my wheelers up through the bottom so you got a good grip, and then you take the leaders and come back through your fingers here where they cross in your hand. This way here, you've got your fingers and thumbs to re-grab on your other set of lines. Uh, he always taught me, like, when you turn the top, you got to re-grab going to the top. And as you're turning the top, you re-grab here to set up for the bottom. So you can come back in your lane. Some lots of guys, uh, you know, they have their line set, they go up, it's just one pull and one pull to the bottom. But when you're driving a lot of green horses, it's, it's nice to be able to pick up the slack as you're turning, and then you're setting up yourself for the bottom barrel as well. 1996 Calgary Stampede champion Edgar Baptiste has developed his own unique style of folding his slack line. This is my pull line here at the back of the horses, and this is my lead line. It comes over on top of the wheel line of the inside of my hand, and I let let uh, let let the ends drop down in the box. Allen and Buddy Bensmiller, Edgar Baptiste and Herman Flad all began their careers driving on the Northern Chuckwagon Association circuit, and they all jumped at the opportunity to make their first trip to Calgary in 1979 to replace the striking professional drivers who had put on their own meet 30 miles to the south. We decided we'd come out to High River and run and go head and head with Calgary. It was, you know, people, a lot of people thought it was a real stupid idea and you know maybe it was but uh, you know ever since uh, you know Calgary done some things different we done some things different and you know now wagon racing is you know right at the top of its class. George Norman had left the Northern Association the year before to join the professional ranks. His best friend Buddy Benz Miller had planned to join him but instead took the opportunity to race at Calgary and win his first Stampede Championship. Everybody wanted to come to Calgary. Everybody that ever dreamed to run the wagon, they still do when we hit the big one, Calgary. The Northern Association had been running for years and developed their own Benz Miller Racing Dynasty. The new boys on the block quickly fit into Calgary's Western spirit, not just on the track, but downtown at the pancake breakfasts. And the Northern boys brought with them Mae Gorst, the first and only woman to ever outride at the big show. Within three years, the rival groups were running together in Calgary, and 10 years after the rift, Buddy Bensmiller dueled it out with aggregate champion George Norman, along with Dallas Dorchester and Richard Cosgrave in a heart-pumping $50,000 dash for cash. It was a classic race. All four wagons finished less than a second apart, with Buddy beating his best friend George by a mere six one hundredths of a second. Well, I guess it couldn't have turned out much better. I guess uh, he ended up with the truck and I ended up with the 50. He probably wished it would have been the other way around, but uh, still he was happy for me and, you know, and that's, that's what kept us close, I guess. Six years later, Buddy was on the flip side of the coin losing the $50,000 prize to Ward Willard by a horse's nose, three hundredths of a second. Tight finishes and a tight-knit community. There are few groups closer than the Chuck Wagon Racing Fraternity, few sports where the family works so hard and so closely together. 
know, not only my outfit, but I think just about every outfit, uh, your family is. If if you don't have that family atmosphere in wagon racing, you you know you ain't gonna be around very long. Uh, it, it's it's such a it's one of the you know the sports that really requires your whole family, like you know, and it, right from your grandsons on, like you know, they 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 love to come and they all help. Yeah, the whole family works. They get in and clean the barn and lead horses and brush horses and feed and all the wives they. They get in there too. It is a definitely a wonderful family thing. The wife and the four kids, they all travel with me. Well, they did up till this year, and the two oldest now are kind of going their own ways, but they come when they can, and uh, I always feel better when the family's with me because I don't have to worry about them at home. You know, I can concentrate more on my horses if they're with me. I enjoy lots of people around. This is a family sport. There's lots of work back at the barns that I rely on Cindy my family to look after. Probably if you hired it out, you probably couldn't have paid someone enough money to do it. Everybody gets along pretty well. You have to, eh? You go from May till October there, everybody's at the same shows and everything. To, to do all the work that there is involved, you gotta love the horses. And then to win, you gotta be competitive. And you have to have that combination to, to stay on top. It's it's a good life. I, li I like the horses and, you know, you can, you have a bad run, you mope around and walk by the next guy that beats you the night before and his chest's out and he's strutting and then you beat him the next night and he's down and you're up and it's, it's, uh, it's an up and down game. This is a community that celebrates its heroes and sometimes must mourn them. A world full of traditions where the past is almost as important as the future and both are tied inextricably together. Gets a guy pumped when you know your grandfather did so well and your dad and your uncle and just makes me proud of them I guess and just hope I can just fill their shoes someday. Well here we are again today risking our lives for very little pay but it's a life we'll choose and it's a life we'll live and Lord we don't ask anyone to give. But we want to thank you Lord for the many trouble free miles that we travel each year up and down the highways and the dusty old roads, knowing that you're near. Now we ain't always been straight or took a religious stand, but when we crawl up on the seat of that wagon and look back at the family, there's someone we truly believe in, and you're the man. And we turn them barrels and she lifts up on two. I sometimes hear a little voice saying, don't worry son, I'm in here too. In the past you've taken a few drivers, a few outriders, even the odd child or two. But really, Lord, no one has ever blamed you. So we don't ask that you take us to heaven or never run in stormy weather. But when it's all over and you gather since your mighty kingdom come, would you please keep us all together?